Hi, welcome to Hillcrest Sermons, Growing Together. Show us your heart's delight. My name's Tim. I want to say welcome this morning. Welcome on this first Sunday of Advent. It is good to be with you this season when we look back to the first arrival of uh, the Son of God in human history and we, uh, we look ahead to when Jesus will return and make all things well. And uh, thank you for being with us today. So um, this Advent season, uh, Carlo mentioned this earlier, but what we're going to do during these weeks of Advent is for kind of our teenage times, we're going to look at these classic uh, these classic Christmas carols that are just saturated in scripture, songs that we've probably sung hundreds of times and heard thousands of times um, that, are, that re- flow right out of the good news of who Jesus is and look at the scripture behind them and what they might say to our lives today. And I hope that uh, for years afterwards, you hear these songs differently and they remind you of just how good the good news is. And so today, the song we're going to look at is one of my very favorite, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, um, this haunting and beautiful song, uh, almost, almost lament-like, uh, as we long, uh, as we long for the return of Jesus. And so, um, I want to start by just telling you a little of the backstory of this song. So, come, come, Emmanuel. Um, how do we get it? Where did it come from? Mid 1800s uh, in England, there's a guy, John Mason Neal. There he is, an uh, uh, excited kind of looking guy, uh, you know, real life of the party kind of man. And uh, he was a president of a college. I mean, president of a college. Uh, he uh, was involved in the Anglican Church. Started a, a, an order of nuns to help the poor. He was real involved in social welfare for orphans and, and young women. Uh, and uh, he also, in his spare time, he translated old. Greek and Latin hymns. I mean, this is what people did before there's YouTube. Like, so he's, he's, um, he's translating hymns. And, and one year, in like 1851, he finds in the appendix of a hymnal from 1710. So this is 100 years before, 150 years before him. He finds this song. This is it. Actually, this is actually the appendix from the 1710 hymnal. Um, this song, uh, Veni, Veni, Emmanuel. This, this O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And he translates this song, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, um, into English. He kind of does the message version, kind of smooths it out. Um, and some other people add uh, some music to it. And so in 1851, we get the song, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And this is actually uh, the song uh, from a hymnal from that uh, time. So this is where the song, and then and it ends up becoming popular and getting sung all over the world. But you're probably asking yourself, where did the 1710 lyrics come from? And I'm glad you asked that question because those lyrics are actually based on a medieval Latin chant that monks would chant in the seven days leading up to Christmas. This is actually a manuscript from the 800s. And these, these, uh, these, uh, there were seven verses in the seven days leading up to Christmas called the O Antiphons. You say O Antiphons? And these O antiphons, they would, they would, they would, uh, they were based on seven Old Testament prophecies, seven identities of Jesus: O come, Emmanuel; O come, Wisdom on high; O come, Lord of Might; O come, Rod of Jesse. Except they're in Latin, not that, you know, obviously English. And so, in the seven days leading up to Christmas, they would chant these O antiphons: O come, these identities of Christ prophesied in the Old Testament. But you, you might be thinking to yourself, is that they're from the 800s? Wait, there's more. Um, there's a book by Boethius, The Consolation of Philosophy. I know you're probably reading it right now. It's from the 500s. And Boethius, actually some scholars believe that he quotes the lyrics from the Oentiphon, so it may go all the way back to the 500, which, total rabbit trail, Boethius, Consolation of Philosophy. C.S. Lewis says one of his all-time top 10 books. So it's worth reading. Um, so let me summarize, if you heard, you know, you're like, Tim, I am, you're losing me here, history. Like, let me just summarize everything I just said for you. The song, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, is old. <laughs> Very old. <laughs> the lyrics, at least, you know. So, so uh, you know, maybe up to uh, 1,500 years that followers of Jesus have been chanting and singing uh, this desire, O come Emmanuel, O come wisdom on high, O come rod of Jesse, that this is O come desire of nations. This has been this thing that uh, followers of Jesus have returned to. And which, of course, you know, what is it about these words 
that have so captured people? That why is it this has been so important to people for so many centuries? What is it that is the lasting power of these words? And uh, for myself, when as I've thought about this, and I mean, there's no way to, you know, definitively answer that question, but I think part of it has to do the way the lyrics to a Como Como Manual combine two things. They combine profound truth about who Jesus of Nazareth is with this real sense of ache and longing that the world is not yet the way God desires it. And it's this combination of truth and ache in the same words. And I think the modern melody captures that sense so well. I think it's that combination that speaks so profoundly to followers of Jesus over and over again. Because it speaks to the reality of our experience, the reality of the incredible good news of who Christ is and when his spirit meets us, like the good news that that is. And yet the reality that his kingdom has not yet come in full and there is still sin and evil and injustice. And, and to deny that is to deny our lived experience. I think it's this tr- combination of truth and ache that, uh, that has spoke to so many uh, followers of God over the centuries. I mean, and it's interesting, even the way the lyrics are designed, um, you know, O Como Como Emmanuel and Ransom Captive Israel, the, the, they, the lyrics ask us to kind of put ourselves in the shoes of ancient Israelites before the Messiah has come. I mean, that's kind of, that's kind of, uh, that's who we, in, that's how we inhabit the song. We kind of imagine what would it have been like to be, uh, you know, to live before the birth of Jesus and to be longing for the Messiah to come, the Messiah, for God to visit his people, to God forgive sins. What would it be like? And so the, the, in the song, it captures that longing. And yet by, by, by having us sing that way, it also speaks to the reality that as followers of Jesus after the cross and resurrection, we still experience that same longing. That yes, like God's love has been poured out uh, into our lives through Christ, and yet we still long for the day that Jesus will come again and bring his kingdom of justice and peace in full. The kingdom has not yet come in full. Uh, Ian Proven, if you were last week, wrapped up Leviticus and actually talked about the same idea, this now and not yet. That now Jesus' kingdom has begun, but not yet has it come in full. And yet, that, so there's this, this aspect of longing of the ancient Israelites, longing for the Messiah that we can still identify. We still long for the Messiah to come and set all things right. I think it's this truth and ache that has spoken to so many people. Because, because when we come to Christmas, like it is, like Christmas is, um, you know, it's a season of joy. And we, rem- like, we thank God for the good news that Jesus has shown up in the world that, and he has made a pathway for us to be right with God. And yet, yet we, don't, we don't need a kind of a happy, clappy Christmas that denies the reality of suffering and hurt that still is in our world. And it's, and it's, the, it's to be able to have the joy and to name the joy while also naming the sorrow, that I think speaks to what it means to truly follow God in this world. And I, you know, as a as a a pastor uh, at Hillcrest Church, one of the one of the privileges uh, we get as a pastoral team is to is to pray over the aches of this community. You know, every Tuesday, the pastoral team, we join together, we pray for the things that are going on in the life of this community. And, and there's, there's just real, there's real ache. There's real ache. There's, you know, marriage is hanging on by a thread. There's things that, impri- you know, alcoholism and addictions that imprison people. There's abuse. There's, uh, there's death. There's the fear of death. There's cancer. And there's these, these aches that we feel depression and suicidality like the ache and even and even beyond our community we pray for the world and we pray for the places that our heart is attached to uh through missionaries like roger and Therese, we pray for sri lanka we pray for myanmar we pray for the uyghur people in china and 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 while we celebrate the joy of christmas we do that naming the ache of this world and I think even as we enter into this Advent season for you, where's your ache this Advent? 
There's things that maybe intellectually uh, we feel, and maybe there's things that are quite visceral for you this Advent season. That to just kind of uh, happy, clappy Christmas and pretend everything okay is just not true. What is that thing? This is an ache that your heart feels this Advent season. You're longing. The song, O Come, O Come, you know, speaks to the truth of who Christ is. And it also identifies the ache that we feel in a world marred by sin and death and evil. So I want to walk through, I want to walk through the song. Um, walk through and sing through the song this morning. Uh, but uh, it would be unkind of me to lead the singing. Um, so... Um, uh, my friend Rachel Daly is going to come and be on the piano, and we're going to kind of go back and forth, talk about these different verses, and then we'll sing it, and then talk about it and sing it. And uh, so uh, thank you, Rachel. This is a kind of you to do this. Yes. So, um, and we're actually going to, you know the, the, the verse that we, tr- the, in, in, in the English version, O Como, O Como Manual, that's in the English version, the first one. In the Latin version, the medieval one, that's actually the last one. And we're going to save that to the end. And I'll explain there's a reason that it's designed that way. So we'll get there uh, in a moment. So uh, let's just kind of, there's actually, so seven verses. I'll try and move quickly, but I just want to touch on each one because it's so saturated in Scripture. And I actually printed, I don't have, I printed copies of uh, the lyrics with verses, and they're kind of on the way out this morning. If you want to take one of those home, um, you can grab one of those. So uh, let's see. So the first verse, uh, O come wisdom on high. And it's interesting, Proverbs 8 talks about God creating the world through wisdom, and many Christians have found that to be a reference to Christ. And then in uh, 1 Corinthians one twenty four, it actually speaks quite directly. It says that um, Jesus crucified is the wisdom of God wiser than man's wisdom? That, that Christ is the wisdom of God. And, and you know, that, that means a number of things, but the least thing I think it means is that when we say that Jesus is the wisdom of God, that Jesus, in his, in his life and his teachings, he lived and demonstrated the fullest possible human life, the wisest, the most flourishing human life, and that we need his wisdom, we need his way of life to come break into our lives. I mean, in this way, the, the, the Jesus movement is very similar to the 12-step movements of our world today. The kind of the, be, the beginning, the entryway into following Jesus is naming, like, I can't live the best, the good and beautiful life on my own. I need a wisdom. I need a power. I need someone from the outside to come and bring the, the best possible life into my life. Life. I need, the, I need the, the pathway laid out. I need the wisdom of God. And so to sing, O come, wisdom on high, is to, is to identify the, the, in our own heart the, the dysfunction, to, to identify our own shadow side, the own mal, the, our own malfunctions, the ways that we are not leading the good life on our own, and say, God, I need your wisdom in my life. And so we sing our longing for God's wisdom in our life. Let's sing this together. Oh, come thou wisdom from on high and order all things far and nigh to us the path of knowledge show and cause us in And the strobe effect just kind of adds to it in there. That's like, that's the, the feeling, yeah. The next verse is uh, identified. It says, O come, Lord of might. And the Lord of might, Lord, in, uh, is, is a, a way to speak about Yahweh from the Hebrew scriptures, like God's mighty acts. We've been talking in the Leviticus series about um, how God is the God in the Exodus who heard the cry of his people oppressed in Egypt, and he responded to their cry of oppression to to save them. He's the Lord of might who rescues to save. And the New Testament, of course, says that it names this this mighty God of the Hebrew Scriptures. It names this mighty God as Father, Son, Spirit, the triune God, who Jesus the Son comes and identifies. Says, "I I am the same Lord of might who you encountered." in the Exodus. I'm the same uh, Lord of might who hears the cry of the oppressed and acts to save them. 
And so when we think, I mean, I think if uh, wisdom is looking at our own hearts, I think Lord of Might is looking out into the world. Where are those places of injustice and oppression where people are crying out, where we say, oh, Lord of Might, come and do acts of deliverance again. Let's sing our longing to the Lord of Might. Oh, come, oh, come, thou Lord of mine, who to thy tribes on Sinai's heart in ancient times did give. The next one is if you're if you're un if like it's probably the, one of the more strange sounding ones if you're uh, unfamiliar with kind of Christianese stuff the rod of Jesse, and I mean this is the kind of thing like in middle school somebody calls you the rod of Jesse you get in a fight you call me what yeah the rod of Jesse so a couple you got to know a couple things to understand this one in the uh, for the ancient Israelites the king that they thought oh man this was the best human king we ever had was a man named David. And they, said, and they said, when they talked about the Messiah, they said, someday when the Messiah comes, it'll be a, it'll be a king like David. Uh, well, David's dad's name was Jesse. And so there's a connection between Jesse and the coming Messiah. And there's this, uh, there's this prophecy in Isaiah 11 that talks about, um, it talks about this prophecy of the coming Messiah. And it says, uh, it's essentially like this metaphorical image of imagine Jesse as like a tree stump. And there's this, this uh, fresh um, branch that sprouts out of it, green leaves. That's a picture of the Messiah. And it, uh, in the King James Version, it calls that fresh little sprout a rod. And so the rod of Jesse, this is an image of the arrival of David. And then in Isaiah, Isaiah 11, it talks about how this, this, um, this Messiah, this uh, rod of Jesse, would be the one to defeat death. And of course, this gets picked up in the New Testament, how Jesus defeats death in the resurrection and will return again to defeat death once and for all. And I think about just the ache that death causes in our world. And knowing that the Messiah has defeated it and will, re and will return again to put death to death, finally. And so we sing our longing for the rod of Jesse. Oh, come thou Jesse free thine own from Satan's tyranny from depths of hell thy people say and give them victory o'er the grave it if Rod of Jesse was confusing, this next one probably is close to just as confusing because the next one is the key of David. And, uh, and so this, in, there's this kind of obscure uh, prophecy in Isaiah 22, 22 that talks about the key of David and it gets picked up in Revelation 3, 17. That talks about Jesus having the key of David. And here this song, it, it even calls Jesus the key of David. But essentially the idea is, is just this. The key of David in these two contexts, it talks about spiritual authority to lock and unlock spiritual realities, to open like door, spiritual doors and close spiritual doors. And, and it's just simply being used here. It, the, the idea is pretty straightforward, that, that the doorway to right relationship with God, the doorway to being right with God, to walking right with God, to knowing that you are a child of God, there's nothing that stands between you and God, that Jesus is the key that unlocks that door. And that he desires to unlock that door for every single human being and for them to walk through it and be in right relationship uh, with God. And so we sing our, our own longing for ways that we desire to be, to experience that rightness with God. And we sing our longing for others to know that they can walk through that door as well. Oh, come thou key of day. Close the 
Oh, come, O oh, day spring, is the next verse. And day spring, to me, it sounds like, a, I don't know, a spa brand or something. Oh, come, day spring. Day spring is it's a King James way of referring to the first light of dawn. Uh, and there's numerous prophecies that speak of the coming of the Messiah, the coming of God's rescue being the light that breaks through the darkness. Isaiah 9, those living in land of darkness have seen a great light. Malachi 4. Um, and this actually gets picked up, these, these images of the Messiah coming and bringing light, they actually get picked up in a prophecy in, in Luke 1 that I just think has the most beautiful language. In Luke 1, talking about what Jesus will be to the world, it says, because of the tender mercy of our God, by which of the rising of the sun will come to us. It is the tender mercy of our God which brings Jesus the light in the darkness. And, you know, that this it's really this almost primal imagery of light and darkness, good and evil, and, of course, darkness and, uh, stands for injustice and evil and the light of Christ, the goodness and justice and peace that Jesus uh, desires to bring into our lives and our world. And so we sing our longing for the light of Christ. Oh, come thou day spring, come. The next one is the desire of nations, which I think is such a beautiful phrase. In, um, in Haggai 2.7, it's talking about um, God coming to his people and refers to him as the desire of nations. And the word nations there, I think, is particularly powerful because um, nations in, in Hebrew, it's a reference. You know, these Hebrew scriptures like Haggai was written to the Israelite people. And so nations is another way of saying um, Gentiles, of all the other tribes, of all the other ethnicities, of all the other nations. It's this, this multi-nation, multi-tribal, multi-ethnic vision that all these people groups, their heart's desire is ultimately for the God who made them and desires to redeem them. And so when we say, when we long for the desire of nations to come, I mean, we're longing for, for God's kingdom to be the multi-ethnic kingdom, for, for, the, for, the, for all the ways, and we see it, I mean, quite uh, in the news every day, for the way that nations and people groups and ethnicities are pitted against one another. And I think about Russia and Ukraine, and I think about Israel and Palestine, and I think about these, the, the, the desire of nations, we long, we sing our longing for the desire of nations to come and bring his peace to the world. Oh, come desire of nations by all peoples in one heart and mind. Bid envy, strife, and quarrel cease. Fill So that, this was the order, uh, this was the order of the verses uh, that it was uh, in that medieval chant. This was the order that they were chanted in. And then the last one would be uh, Emmanuel. We'll get to that in a minute. But the reason, I want to just kind of explain the reason, because it's interesting. Uh, what, what would happen is if you took the first letter to each of these titles of Christ, it was an acrostic, and it made a word. And it, the Latin word was arrow cross. Did I put a slide to this? No, I didn't. Okay, that's my fault. Um, arrow cross. So uh, I don't know any Latin, so that I read this, but arrow cross means tomorrow I will come. Tomorrow I will come. And so, I mean, the, the, the whole, and this is that, that, that reality that we talked about, the whole song, the, the, the whole idea is it combines the, this powerful, beautiful truth about who the Son of God is and our ache for him to arrive again and to set all things right. That we've tasted, the kingdom has come, we've tasted it, and it has not yet come in full. And so it's this combination of truth and ache, the now and not yet 
that is the followers of Jesus lived experience. So what does this mean for us? Before we get to our our final verse, what does it mean for our lives today? What does it mean uh, as we live into this Advent? I want to just suggest a couple things that it might mean uh, for us. You know, um, I want to maybe speak first to those uh, who, who are here in a quite a skeptical place. Maybe you're, you're a person, you're like, I'm not, I am not sure that there is even a God. Tim, I, I'm a, maybe you're a person, you're like, I am an evidence-based person. If I don't see it, if I can't touch it, I don't know if it's real. And if you're here, my guess is you, you, you have that, but my guess is you also feel this ache and longing that I've been talking about. And I think for the, the kind of the pure materialist, this was uh, the problem of good. What is this goodness that you long for? That, that why is it that when a child's life ends too early, it, it's not just our herd instinct reacting to that, but the sense of this is deeply wrong. And if this physical world is all there is, what what is that ache about? Where does that come from? And what's more, if this world is all there is, what do we do with that? Does the innocent victim ever get justice if this world is all there is? And if this world is all there is and we want some kind of justice and goodness, uh, is this life our only chance for justice and goodness? Because Because that has led... For some people, to the conclusion that I should be able to do any, use any means necessary to set up a world of justice as I see fit. And I think maybe, maybe the good news of this now and not yet reality, the truth and ache that this song points to, is that there is goodness, there is justice, and that ultimately it doesn't reside in our hands that we can trust another to come again and set all things right. Maybe what else does this mean for us? Maybe you're a person, maybe the Christian faith is newer to you. And maybe you've begun following Jesus and you're beginning to figure this out. And, or maybe you're just kind of coming back to faith. And maybe somewhere along the way, you've picked up the idea that, that Jesus coming to the world, that, that trusting in Jesus means that we're always happy. That, every, that we, the way we see the world, everything must always be good, that it's good news and things must be good and right. But maybe in your heart, there's, you've, you've wrestled with because it doesn't, it doesn't always feel right. You know there's things out of order in your own soul. You know there's things out of order in your relationships. You know there's things out of order when you look out in the world. And maybe you have trouble putting together like the sense of these places that are out of order and this sense that oh, aren't we always supposed to be happy? You know, it's good news. And maybe... The real good news for you today is that the life of walking with Jesus can celebrate with joy the truth of who Christ is and can also name the sorrow and ache of living in a world still marred by sin and death and evil. And these things aren't mutually exclusive, but the good news is this is actually the way of Jesus. Or maybe you're a person, and maybe this is a reality that you've known for a long time. Maybe you're a follower of Jesus, and you're like, I know the joy, and I know the sorrow. And I would just say, I hope you hear the Father's voice saying to you, well done. My son knew the joy and sorrow as well. See, to follow Jesus means that our lives get pressed into the shape of crosses, and this is what the life of Jesus looks like, the life of walking after him, that we know deeply the joy of the right relationship with the Abba. We know the Spirit's presence. We know what it means to live lives of generosity and forgiveness. And we also know what it means to do those things in a world where evil and sin and injustice are still on the loose, and even on the loose in our own very hearts. And we turn our hope again and again and again to this Emmanuel, is God with us. 
if you want to dig deeper this week into these things, I did. I mentioned this earlier, but I printed sheets. Um, and it kind of works out. Seven days, you could take one verse a day, one verse of the song. And I print it with the verses and then the, uh, the scriptures go along with it. And I put them on the table. There's a table there and a table there. And then at the info table, surprise, Kathy, they're going to be there with you. Um, and so uh, if you want to do that with, on your own or with your housemates or your family, that would be a wonderful way of reflecting more deeply on this. Where? What, is, what aspect of Jesus' identity is he wanting to, to press on your heart this Advent season? But this last, and actually, let's all invite the worship team. Um, come on up, because uh, we'll, we'll move into this last, the first and last uh, stanza uh, here together. But let me just talk about it for a moment as they come up here. So the, the, the first one in our English version and the last one in the kind of that uh, Middle Ages version was O Come Emmanuel. And Emmanuel... Um, uh, is a, it's, a, it's a Hebrew word. Kathy read it from Isaiah 7.14. Um, and it's a pretty simple, it's a pretty simple word, uh, Hebrew word. Im is with. And anu, it's a kind of an ending. It means us. And then el is God. Uh, and it's a, it's a name, uh, the with us God. Uh, the with us God. And, and in Matthew uh, 1.23 that was read at the beginning of our service, I, Jesus is identified as the with us God. And, uh, and this is the one we sing to, the with us God, who shut up in the flesh in human history in Jesus of Nazareth. The with us God, who is with us by his very spirit in us, even here this morning. And the with us God, who promises to return again to make all things well. And so we sing our longing together. Why don't you stand if we're able? Let's sing our longing to the with us God. Thanks for listening. For more info, visit hcbellingham.com and join us any Sunday, 9 and 11 a.m.